We're back on Talk Asia with Ken Hirai. Ken, in 1992, you turned up at a Sony audition where you beat out 7,500 other people for the sole contract which was on offer. Paint us the picture of what that day was like for you. That day? Well, I was just so purely happy. I don't think I will ever forget about that day for the rest of my life. I remember every single minute, every single second. I was 20 years old then, and a third-year student in university. I had been dreaming about being a singer ever since I was a little kid. The audition didn't make me a professional singer right away. It is such a large-scale audition. It took a whole year. Each finalist even had their own stylist and director. I enjoyed the whole process. Actually, I still have some friends from the audition, my competitors at that time. I remember back then, when I won that first audition, I got out from the venue and called my friend in university using a public phone, since there were no cell phones at the time, and I cried over the phone. And, you know, you certainly do come across as an incredibly sensitive guy. Has that not, though, been a bit of a drawback in an industry like this, where you've got to be so thick-skinned if you're going to survive? It is true that I am very sensitive and timid, but there are many tough and aggressive people in the music industry. So I often feel isolated and out of place. Sometimes I think I shouldn't be there when I see other showbiz people at the shooting of a music program, for example. But if I were to put my love of singing and my timidity on a scale, my love of performing would always win. That's why I'm still doing it. But to be honest with you, I often get nervous. And I don't have a lot of ambition either. With my character, I guess I would be perfect for being a civil servant or something like that. It's amazing to hear you say that because, you know, there are absolutely no shortage of fans out there who love what you do. Still, you know, you say, look, I'm not a star. In fact, I'm actually quite worried about failure. Is it something in you that sort of looks around and says, what if all of this is too good to be true? Well, I have made many small mistakes, and not everything I have done has worked out brilliantly. So I don't think of my career as too good to be true. My career has not always been smooth sailing, but I do agree that I have been rather privileged. You were also chosen by Stevie Wonder to join him on stage and sing one of his most famous songs with him as well. What was it like to stand up there in front of all those people and sing You Are the Sunshine of My Life with a celebrity like him? There is nobody other than him on this earth whom I feel more humble when I stand in front of. He is such a great person and such an inspiration for me. I would be more nervous to meet him than if I was to meet President Bush. Stevie Wonder is that huge to me. I was beyond being nervous. And to be honest, I really don't remember much about it today. But what I remember was that he was very gentle when I met him. I was suddenly called backstage while other people were praying in a circle, hand in hand, before the concert. I was pushed right into the circle, right next to Stevie Wonder, and I took his hand. He didn't know that it was me next to him. So his manager told him that the person next to him was me. After that, he personally asked me to sing You Are the Sunshine of My Life together with him. One of the scariest sounding things that you've done is to sing at the uh, Apollo Theatre in uh, New York's Harlem, that's a rite of passage for, you know, anyone who's anyone in R&B, but it's a frightening thing. Getting booed off stage there is not unusual. 
What was your Apollo experience like? You're right. It was really frightening. There was a stump of wood at the Apollo, and it's been said that everyone, including Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder, has touched this wood before performing at amateur night. If you touch it before you sing, you will succeed. I was told this hundreds of times during rehearsals, but I was so panicked, I forgot to touch the stump before I got to the stage. And of course, there were some people who were booing me. I still remember the faces of those people, because it was really nasty. But in the end, I managed to finish singing, and I received a big round of applause. I sang Lately by Stevie Wonder and Amazing Grace. I was relieved that at least I could finish singing both songs to the end. One of America's most influential R&B artists, Babyface, said that you could be an international hit if only you'd sing in English. The last song is called Missing You. And this song, the song uh, was produced by Babyface. So is world domination on your to-do list? I took his words as the greatest compliment but it sounds a bit like flattery. I feel like he's overestimating me somewhat. Worldwide popularity would be a great thing to achieve, but I have a real attachment to the idea of singing Japanese songs in my first language. That doesn't mean I don't want to be internationally recognized or that I'm giving up on the idea of being world famous. But I truly enjoy singing Japanese songs in Japanese. Coming up, his unique looks set housewives' hearts aflutter, but what does he think? Well, it was not only when I was a teenager, even now. Don't really